We have with us some great panelists as well as Dr. Robert Cloudy Jr. who's going to give the opening address. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, I don't know how much of an address it is. Uh, I'd like to thank each of you for attending. Uh, we have a great session today. And for those of you who are listening to the recording, uh, everybody on here will uh, obviously stand out to you for their credentials and their ideas. Uh, what we want to focus on today is really uh, the idea of learning assessment. Uh, as it's getting credibility, how essentially do we assess uh, open educational resources? Uh, at Empire State College, we've been focusing on this. Our history has been, as an institution, to really focus on prior learning assessment. So we've invited in a number of people who uh, are really impressive in the field to get out uh, the ideas and have people joining us. So let me just run through our panel today is we have five individuals. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Kathy Leaker, uh, my colleague, who is uh, the Associate Dean at our Metropolitan Center in Manhattan. And she's a mentor in the Culture Studies area of study and Associate Dean and uh, is a hockey fan as well. So uh, Kathy is a good friend and a wonderful colleague, and I look forward to her presentation. With her will be Francis Boyce, who is a mentor from our Long Island Center in Hopog, New York. And uh, she's a mentor in business management and economics. And we have Dr. Luke Dowden, who is director of distance learning at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, who has been very busy, uh, given that his organization, Cal, which is the Center for Adult Learning in Louisiana, which is executive director, just held their conference about a week ago. Uh, also with us is Tina Grant, who's the director of NCCRS, which was formerly known as Ponzi. And NCCRS uh, oversees the credit recommendations and assessments, uh, both for multiple forms of training as well as being accepted by multiple institutions for credit. And then we have Steve Phillips, who's the content development associate from Sailor. And Sailor is a partner with us on a Lumina grant, which we're currently working on. And of course, Amy McQuig, who is our coordinator for open education, who not only is an important participant and is managing our grant on, uh, open ed on assessing open educational resources, but uh, has put this whole program together. And uh, I thank her for that. And Amy? Please sure. proceed. So I would like to welcome Kathy Leaker and Francis Boyce um, to start your presentation on PLA and women of color. Hi, this is Francis Boyce. Kathy and I have been running um, workshops um, for women of color to help them find ways of doing PLA. We call it PLA and women of color. Uh, sharing learning, sharing strength. Uh, do I have control over the PowerPoint? You should. Um, if not, just let me know and I can turn the slides. Yeah. Can, you, uh, can you advance one slide for me, please? Today, in our presentation, we're going to discuss the model that we've created for peer support and open approaches to PLA. We're going to discuss what it is we're doing, why it's open, why, what makes us think it will work, and what our next steps are. Can you advance to the next? Kathy? Hi, everyone. It's Kathy Leaker speaking. Um, so basically, this was a project that um, Francis and I started together and have since enlisted the support of some wonderful colleagues. What we wanted to do is create a workshop series specifically for women of color to sort of help them think about what role PLA might play in their educational process. Um, so first of all, we thought, as Francis is going to show with some demogra demographic data, that women of color being successful and encouraged in this process is crucial to their retention and college success. Uh, we really wanted to create a sensitive and strength-based peer community in which women of color could really talk and, and, and figure out what they had to bring um, and feel supported in that. Um, and then we thought it would be very important, uh, and we'll be discussing this a little bit more later, that we as a, the academy benefits by hearing more about the learning experiences of women of color and of thinking about what those might mean um, if uh, analyzed as academic college level learning. So um, we began by really thinking about 
well, what does this have to do with openness? Um, and we really looking through um, uh, Meg Benke, Alan Davis, and Nan Travers' uh, piece uh, in the book Game Changers. Um, they really emphasize the sort of enduring demographic and uh, social justice notions of open. And um, I mean, open could also be and has been used in various kinds of neoliberal and, and not so uh, socially just agendas. So it isn't necessarily equivalent with opportunity. It isn't necessarily equivalent with ideals of social justice. But it certainly can be. And that's what we're hoping this project can do. OK, and um, here we have some wonderful data, which I just love. Um, so we're looking at attainment uh, gaps in earning degrees. And we're looking at the difference between the dark blue is 1975 and the light blue is 2010. And you, know, you can see that the growth in attainment for uh, bachelor's degrees for African Americans is about half the growth it is for white Americans. And it's only about, um, you know, it's even less than that for Hispanic Americans. So one of the things we're thinking about is, is there a possibility that PLA can help increase the attainment rates and close the gaps that we're seeing? Uh, can some, oh, thank you. <laughs> so on this graph, when you're looking at the, the two graphs, most to your left, you're looking at the difference between um, black non-Hispanics getting earning degrees and um, with PLA and without PLA. So just one second. So uh, when you add PLA, the um, associate degree attainment rate for blacks increases 7%. When you add PLA, again, the bachelor's degree attainment rate increases 23%. The no degree rate decreases by 26%. That is a pretty significant increase. The, the two graphs in the middle are for um, Hispanics uh, populations. So the associate's degree rate attainment rate increases 11% when you have students who have completed prior learning assessment. The bachelor's degree attainment rate increases 41% when you add prior learning assessment. The no degree attained rate decreases by 50% if you have students doing PLA. And the two graphs toward the right are looking at white students. For white students, if you, add, if you have a student completing PLA, the attainment rate for the associate's degree increases 4%. Um, the bachelor's degree attainment rate increases 25% with PLA. The uh, no degree attained rate decreases to 25%. So it's clear that the addition of PLA at, can significantly change how the, the quantity of degrees earned. And it can really help those gaps that we saw in the previous slide. One of the reasons we isolated this to women is because there's another piece of data that tells us that if a woman gets one to six credits of prior learning assessment, it will decrease her time to graduation more than a man who gets the same amount of credit. So what Kathy and I thought was, what would happen to graduation attainment rates if we combined women and um, ethnic status? So that's sort of the, the crucial question and, and research that, um, idea that we're looking at. So um, and, and, and assumedly, if this is successful, I think you could see how um, this becomes open that's also about social justice. Um, so why did we think that this might be successful, that this approach? Essentially, um, essentially we're coming at it um, with, from three different critical strands. The first is what I sort of called egalitarian PLA. And that's the notion of prior learning assessment as being broadly open to anybody um, and, and in an effort to sort of redress um, certain kinds of exclusions that have happened in the academy. Um, so we thought uh, we wanted to think of prior learning assessment and definitions of college level learning in the broadest possible terms. So not necessarily in terms of, for example, an exam or a certificate. Not that there's any problem with those, but we wanted to keep, we wanted to remain open to any kind of uh, college level learning no matter where it occurred. Second, um, 
uh, theoretical strand is critical race theory. Um, there's quite a lot of work being done. It's impossible to summarize and do any kind of justice to it. But I would say that there's sort of three key strands that are shaping uh, uh, this project. The first is that critical race theory challenges the notion that knowledge can be completely neutral, right? Um, that actually all knowledge is experienced through race, gender, class. So that's one critical component of critical race theory that shapes this project. Um, a second way that critical race theory shapes the project is that it really looks very carefully at the ways that race and racism impact educational structures, practices, and discourse. So there's a sort of assumption that race and racism are embedded in our institutional structures. And then finally, um, it attempts to take away this notion of the deficit model of communities of color um, or as places of lacking education and instead tries to insist um, that there's strength and that there's cultural assets and wealth that we need to attend to. So that's the second uh, strand. And then the last strand, and, and there's actually been a force since we started the project, um, my background is really in composition mm -hmm. theory. And so compositionists are doing a lot of work around how to best support students with developmental needs. Um, and pretty much all the theories would argue that in order to help students develop academically, it has to be embedded. It has to be contextualized. So we were really thinking what better way to embed academic skills than to bring them up when students feel that they're in a position of strength, when they're talking about what they really know well. There's also some work in composition theory. Um, in 1974, the main composition group issued a uh, uh, position called Students' Right to Their Own Language, which affirms students' right to bring their knowledges, their cultures, their language, their ways of being into the academy, and it would be welcomed. And they reaffirmed that position statement in 2006. So, uh, and then sort of more recent work on students' right to their own language have talked about code meshing, and we're trying to think about ways that something like code meshing could be um, a tool for students to use in PLA. Uh, the last thing that's actually not on the slide is Looking at some of the knowledge management literature, our colleague Victoria popova Ganchi has done a lot of work on that. And so that's helping us think through, again, ways that we can use the literature of knowledge management to help students, to help open up, I would say, our PLA practices. So in the, the workshop series that we're giving a soft launch to this spring, we've edited it down to three workshops. The first one, Valuing Our Voices, in which we had students view some videos and, and look at uh, some famous black women and how they had a, acquired learning in their lives and accessed different types of learning in their lives. And then we had them think about it in terms, of, the participants think about it in terms of their own learning, their own experience, and, and how those two things intersect. Um, then we had them develop these, just writing down ideas of different things that they could uh, potentially write PLA about. One of the things that's really important to us is that at each workshop, the students walk away with some deliverable, some thing that they have in their hand that they can hold on to and go forward to take next steps. The second workshop, which is actually running this week, is identifying and recording learning. Uh, this is a sort of, uh, Kathy calls it the Montessori approach, where we have different stations. So we have uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Victoria Kopabaganti, who is done a lot of work in concept mapping, showing students how they can do um, concept maps as opposed to essays. We're also doing interviewing stations, and we have our colleague Jeff Lamb, myself, and Kathy interviewing students to have them pull out more information about their learning and, and to access some learning that might have been tacit and, and to make it uh, more concrete. Finally, the, the, the final workshop, which will be held in the third week of April, documenting learning for college audiences, will have the students think about um, what they've done in the first two workshops and write three paragraphs for us to think about how they can start um, a, a prior learning assessment essay on one topic. Or we are also looking into thinking about having them write just a short piece, but maybe using one of their video interviews 
to document their yeah, I'll learning. Yeah, I'll just add to that that we um, are experimenting with actually as uh, video recording the interviews. And our goal, is, as Francis said, is that there's some kind of take home text. So we want to um, have them all uploaded into a closed website where students, when they're writing, when they're thinking, they can just go and rewatch their interviews and think about them. And, and they have been willing to share them with each other so they can watch each other's interviews. They're not long, they're about 10 minutes. But hopefully, Students get so stuck when we're just telling them to write. Hopefully, there's this way of sort of unpacking and generating and, and, and getting some uh, um, energy and excitement in the room about prior learning. I would also add to that a lot of that might have happened in a one to, uh, in a meeting with a student, but then the student leaves with notes. And this allows them to leave with the actual interview and meeting that they can go back to and look at. OK, so midpoint assessment. <laughs> um, so, so far, the attendance of the workshops have been small. And it, that has actually worked out very well, because it allows us to have more substantive dialogue and to really have students bring out more information and, and reflective awareness of what they've done, what they've learned, how they've learned it, and, and even, at times, some of the obstacles to their own learning. Um, do you want me to take the second one, or? Sure. Uh, I, I think the other reason that we've found that we, we actually realized we couldn't work with many more than about six or seven students. Um, there's been quite a lot of disclosure. Um, we use the word intimacy, which is really the environment that, that's been created. And in order to kind of get the comfort with the interview, the comfort with uh, I, we have to create this trust, and, it, and it's difficult to do for reasons that we'll talk about. Um, so the practitioners also have to be really aware of how they're handling, how they're talking, what we're saying. Um, so it's very, it would be very difficult to work with many more students because we're learning in ways that I didn't necessarily know ahead of time. Francis probably believed more than I did or knew more than I did, suspected this. The, we really have to step back and, and, and earn the trust of these students. And, and once we do that, then we do get a lot from them. And one of the things we're having them do, they, they do these um, evaluations and assessments at the end of each workshop. And they are saying that they do feel that their confidence is increasing, that their understanding of what is needed from them in order to, to get prior learning assessment credit is improving, and that they're excited and they want to, you know, we, we say, will you attend the next workshop? They all say yes, and they're really looking forward to it, and they're very engaged. Um, you do the next then, one, Kath? Yeah, so the last thing is that um, we found that the, the feelings that the students bring to both the PLA experience, but even to their own understanding of what it means to articulate knowledge, are probably more important than the cognitive skill of, well, this is college level. <laughs> this is what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I remember a conversation amongst the facilitators where one of us said, well, you know, they just need to not have the anger. You can't be angry in your PLA. And, and, and what we've actually learned is, um, Anger might be the precondition <laughs> for students to actually be able to start to talk about their learning. They might need to be able to tell us about things that they've been frustrated about and the, the obstacles that they've encountered um, throughout their academic journey. And without that, it's very difficult for them, um, at least from this small subset of students we're working with, to feel that we really are open to hearing what they have to say. So um, this is basically um, halfway through the first iteration of this project. Um, what we've learned or what we, we feel like our students are teaching us um, and what the implications might be more broadly for PLA. And we're calling this from diversity to anti-racism. Um, there's some literature uh, about diversity that sometimes that can be a more comforting term. And probably what we really need to be talking about um, is anti-racism in terms of, of creating a really open environment for prior learning assessment. And one of the things that, that we have found is that we have had to do training as facilitators. And we have had to have some really 
uh, very difficult conversations so that we can have open conversations with students. And one of the things we had to make ourselves aware of is microaggression. And racial microaggression, I'm going to read you a definition, um, are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults toward people of color. That is from Sue et al., uh, 2007. Um, and, you know, because one of the most important things there is, is unintentioned, but you have to understand that sometimes the idea that uh, even saying all women have the same experience, well, that's not really accurate. You know, women of color have a different experience than white women. And, and there are, there's just numerous uh, examples that we all went through in, in terms of training to have a, a common understanding. And we came to an agreement that, you know, if, if a microaggression did occur, we would stop, we would discuss it as a group with the students and participants there so that it could be an open discussion and it could maintain the, the intimacy of the group we had created. Um, and um, the scholar Sarah Med makes this claim that um, women of color in their process through the through an academy or through an institution of higher learning encounter brick walls um, that those of us who are white simply can't see because we don't run into them. And I think what's happening for us is we're surfacing those brick walls. So we talked about the knowledge that these women are bringing to us. Some of that is really about what the brick walls are, and Microaggressions to some extent are inevitable, and if we can learn more about them, what causes them, um, how they're experienced, I think we can create a, an environment for PLA that really is open and that sort of um, demolishes those brick walls so students really can proceed. And I, I have to say, in our first workshop, we heard um, account after account after account of different kinds of brick walls, not necessarily in the institution, but in the lives, in, in, our, in our students' lives. And I think we'd be naive to think that these brick walls aren't also uh, at Empire State College, aren't also at every institution of higher learning, and aren't also sort of inherent in the PLA process. So hopefully we can surface those and make sure that they don't impede students. And I guess we, um, and this was a quotation we chose from Audre Lorde to put on, on the flyer. And um, I think we're learning this over and over um, in every, we've done four workshops, and in every workshop um, it's that speaking, making verbal, and sharing. Uh, last night we had our second workshop here in Manhattan, and when I sort of, when one of us was sort of talking or, or presenting a little overview of um, uh, a particular topic, there was silence in the room. When we asked people just to write, there was silence in the room. But the minute we started talking, doing interviews, um, speaking one-to-one, -one, the, the, the volume in the room became so loud, and the students started talking to one another. So I mean, it's, it's something we know from collaborative learning, but um, I think it also challenges sometimes the notion we have of PLA, which is just the knowledge is in your head. It's very individualistic. So. Um, this is a, we hope it's kind of a really a, a useful and, and kind of breakthrough model for thinking about how to articulate one's prior learning. And we're out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any specific questions anyone had before um, <laughs> Kathy and Francis are out, as they say? Okay, feel free to type them in the box if you have any. And I'd like to welcome Luke Gowden, Director of Distance Learning, University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Hi, Jamie. I hope you can all hear me. Um, we, uh, at, in the, at the Center for Adult Learning in Louisiana for the past six years, have been focused on four core strategies. Uh, one is market research. We really try to do a, a job of understanding those adults uh, who started um, college but never finished. Uh, and then our, our second core strategy is to develop uh, programs and services aimed specifically at those adults. And, and a one spoke of that is that we encourage institutions to have prior learning assessment options. 
Um, our third core strategy is to uh, host and to sponsor marketing, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, adult learning campaigns. Um, and, and those efforts are to try to attract adults with some college and no degree uh, back to one of our 29 online accelerated degree programs. And the third thing that we do, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the fourth uh, core strategy is to share information and inform policy. And so this uh, presentation, our participation in it today is a part of that, that fourth core strategy. At any time, I encourage you to use the chat box and uh, post questions. Um, it, it's nice to follow a real in-depth look uh, at, at all of the factors that impact uh, a person's access to and success with prior learning assessment. I have a little bit broader take than the previous presenters. While I agree with them, um, I think as a whole, um, institutions are um, uh, institutions are uh, discriminate against any credit that that is not their own, uh, and sometimes even discriminate against credit that there's is their own. If you look at the whole schism between uh, what happens in our non-credit shops and our credit shops, and so. Um, I, I think there's a lot of discrimination that happens um, where credit is concerned, uh, regardless of the learner. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today to try to set the context for prior learning assessment. A lot of our work over the last six years has been in the area of what we call institutional culture. Um, and so one of the things that um, you know I want to point out to you is in, in case you're using this language at your institutions, that PLA is not credit for work experiences. Um, it's, it's credit for post-secondary level learning that can be documented. Now that learning may come through work, training, volunteering, or personal experiences, but when we talk about PLA as credit for work experiences, and I know people that have engaged in this work for decades that, that will still make this mistake, um, it really discredits the processes that are in place. There are some benefits to the students. Um, these are a, a one that, that we can document pretty readily, and I'm going to put some um, uh, I'm, I'm going to post some links to some reports that you can provide uh, if you're struggling with this PLA conversation at your institution. Uh, but one is they certainly reduce time to degree completion. And the Kell report, which was uh, referenced uh, previously, and I'll reference here in a moment in, in my future slides. Uh, called Fueling the Race, uh, across 48 institutions of all shapes, sizes, and types uh, showed that students who were engaged in some level of prior learning assessment were more likely to persist and to complete their degrees uh, than those who hadn't. It, with our organization, um, we anecdotally uh, believe that there's a psychological impact. So we don't think it's just about uh, reducing a person's time to degree completion. We think that when you offer someone the opportunity to earn credit uh, for their prior learning, it does two things. And it validates them in two ways. First, they can earn credit. Uh, and so you're in a real way saying to them what you know has value within our structure. But the uh, second psychological impact that I've observed as a former teacher of a of prior learning assessment workshop uh, was that people realized, I really need to take that course. Um, and I think that sometimes we have our, our critics that falsely get focused on the first aspect of, we're going to give away credit, uh, when in fact uh, the Kell research uh, says that the average amount of credit that a PLA graduate earns is 17 credits. Uh, and broken down even further for an associate, a person or an associate's degree, it's 10, 10 hours, 10.5 hours of credit, and for a student earning a bachelor's degree, it's 20.1 hours of credit. So there are some benefits to the student and to the institution. It also is a way that students are earning credit before they ever start. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice that we got from the Southern Regional Education Board from Dr. Bruce Chalou, who is now with the Sloan Consortium, was to strongly consider embedding prior learning um, as an entrance opportunity uh, so that you can allow students at the very beginning to determine what it is they already know so they can focus on what they need to learn. Uh, and these are all of the uh, opportunities that are currently out there now. Uh, I'm sure if you haven't or aren't aware, there's a national portfolio uh, assessment process, Learning Counts, um, and, and if that's something you have not explored, uh, I encourage you to do that. 
uh, if you are going to explore it, you might want to uh, make sure that you, your institution does accept ACE credit. I had some institutions in our state that were interested in learning counts, but first needed to um, work through their understanding of how they accepted and used ACE credits. And of course, uh, the big discussion uh, that, that where PLA is tied in is, you know, how do we validate what someone learns through a MOOC or a massive open online course? So any questions so far? How many of you, if you can let me know through the chat box, just yes or no, I, I didn't put in a poll question, uh, but just yes or no, can you let me know if your institutions are engaged in any of these forms of prior learning assessment? Uh, or if you're interested and um, and and maybe challenged, uh, so uh, you can you can check a green X, uh, green uh, put a green check or a red X, or you can answer in the chat box. But really like to uh, get you engaged in that way. Give a few people a few time a few minutes to respond. Looks like most of you that are responding are uh, are offering some so far. I'm going to just transition to this next slide. Uh, this is my own opinion, uh, and, and it's just from uh, reading the tea leaves and watching what's occurring uh, daily uh, within my own state and within other states. I think that there's a group of institutions that will survive, and their business model that they use now will always be around. Um, but I think there are a, a tier or tiers of institutions that need to learn how to do a better job of aggregating credit and converting multiple sources, sources of learning into credit. And those that do that will be the ones that survive best. Um, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I, I'm concerned for my institutions in my state, especially those that are focused on adult learners, that they do the very best job at transferring credits, that they find a way um, to validate the learning that um, uh, that's with MOOCs, um, and and that they have a way to accept all the other ways that people people bring their learning. Uh, but I really think that there are institutions that are that began as strictly aggregators of credit. Now, many of us, our crediting agencies don't allow us to fully do that, nor would we want to do that as institutions. Um, but I think that we have to find a better way uh, to recognize learning than we're doing now. I mentioned to you earlier, and you, and you saw previously, uh, that uh, prior learning assessment does produce graduates. Uh, and the Kell Fueling the Race report, I don't know how many of you have uh, seen that report or viewed it. I'm going to uh, try to place um, uh, that link in the chat box. Uh, that's, that's one uh, report that I would point you to. Uh, and then the other uh, report uh, is, or, or it's really a brief, is on moving the starting line through prior learning assessment. With our nation's focus on uh, degree completion, um, those are, are two uh, briefs that may help you in your conversations at your campuses. Uh, and again, you all may be at very advanced levels in delivering prior learning assessment, uh, but in case you still run into those traditional arguments uh, or rebuttals, uh, you actually there's some really good data and information out there now. So again, I, I want to revisit portfolio briefly. I, I think portfolio uh, is one of the ways that we might um, we might aggregate or we might uh, validate learning from a MOOC. I, I think there are certainly other ways. Someone, um, Lori, uh, placed in the uh, in the box that there are some exams at Excelsior, and you know Excelsior may get into the business of of creating exams for MOOCs. We don't know uh, what innovation that they, they may create there, or who knows Empire State may may move in that area. But portfolio has a lot of value for adults. Um, again, you know, it's, it's documenting credit for college level learning. Uh, if you are moving in with, with in the other movement that's there, uh, competency based education, uh, then you, and, and if you're at an institution that's moving in that way, or one that has uh, spent a lot of time documenting your program or course learning outcomes, very easy to have a portfolio system that's a course match. Allow students to write a narrative uh, based on course learning outcomes, but also document. So the portfolio has two components. I think a lot of times when we talk about portfolio, especially to external groups, and I was with an external group, uh, the Workfo National Workforce Boards earlier this week, you know, what's this portfolio stuff? 
it's just a written document. No, it's a written document that's supported by by uh, some level of documentation that the learning did occur. So there are graduates, uh, as you'll see from this next slide, um, the the those people in the Cal Fueling the Race study uh, who earned prior learning assessment credit were more likely 13% over 6% to earn an associate's degree, more likely 43% over 15% to earn a bachelor's degree, and you had a, a lower percentage, 44% compared to 78% who did not uh, earn a degree or credential. We don't just think that's about earning the credit, and it's obvious when you remember the uh, data I gave you a little bit earlier about um, the total amount, the average amount of credit earned. So when should you be talking about PLA with your students? Um, I, I think there's all levels of stages of engagement. Um, one of the things that the Cal study also um, uh, also uncovered is there really is lacking participation. So as good as we may believe prior learning assessment is, um, we we also can see that you know only 25% of the students in the whole study had earned some PLA credit. Uh, and only 4% of those are from community colleges. Now, I was at a community college. I've worked at a community college. and now at a research institution with high research capacity. Uh, and, and sometimes the challenge uh, can be uh, that uh, it's easier to have prior learning applied to higher level courses. But I certainly think there's a place for it in our community colleges. Um, and I think that it's a little disheartening that the participation is lacking. But they're making students aware of the inquiry, inquiry the applicant, the orientation, uh, and the initial advising phases are all the areas I think you should be discussing prior learning assessment with your students. Whether you're using portfolio or some other form of prior learning assessment, we use a broad umbrella uh, with call to describe PLA. Sometimes that PLA is synonymous with portfolio, but we consider all those forms that we showed you a little earlier. So again, here's some uh, links that I've given you. I've also placed those in the chat box um, in case you wanted to look at those um, uh, those reports as we were we were going along uh, my presentation. Uh, I wanted to thank Amy uh, for um, uh, my slide. Looks like it didn't load as, as well, uh, so I'll put my email address in the uh, chat box for you. I, 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 Amy allowed me to move my presentation time uh, just a little bit, uh, but I think that. My, my approach was to try to provide you some context about prior learning assessment, its importance, um, and, and just arm you with some uh, information you could use if you're needing to have that discussion a little bit deeper on your, um, on your at your institutions. Uh, I want to ask you now just a quick question. Uh, it's not a poll. It's a place for you to use the chat box, if you will, on um, what challenges, if any, are you facing with prior learning assessment? at your institution. It could be a specific type. Uh, it could be with the credit transfer. It could be with uh, how you're um, documenting or transcripting uh, the credit. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested to see any responses to the question of any challenges that you face now with prior learning assessment at your institution, particularly if you don't offer it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you a few moments to respond to that. I encourage you to uh, reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, there's my phone number. My email address is in the um, uh, is in the chat window. And I'm happy to talk with you about our experiences with uh, prior learning assessment. Um, I'll, I'll tell you briefly. Uh, probably one of the best um, uh, uh, examples is at Northwestern State University of Louisiana. They're one of our members of Call, where they've embedded the portfolio learning experience in their degree completion program, and so. Um, it's a course that teaches the students how to create a portfolio along with other uh, uh, items that deal with adult learning theory is embedded at the beginning of their program. And their finished product of their capstone of that course is a portfolio that the student can choose to challenge for credit or choose not to. Um, so that's the, um, that's the end of my presentation, Amy, uh, but I'm, I'm real interested if we have any responses from our participants about the challenges that they may be facing with prior learning assessment, if any at all, and there just may be none. But thank you so much to you and Robert for including me, and I hope the information I was able thank to provide. Thank you so much, uh, Luke. And if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to chat in the chat box. <coughs>
And uh, I'll just go ahead and say thank you, Luke. That was phenomenal, and we appreciate your taking the time to uh, join us. And I'd like to introduce Tina Grant, Director of MCCRS, and Steve Phillips from the Sailor Foundation. Hi, thank you, Amy. Um, thank you for inviting us to participate. I definitely enjoyed that and got trying hard to write down everything that Dr. Dobbin was saying. <laughs> um, can everyone hear me okay? Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And then how do I work the slides? Um, you can hit all and then arrow on your keyboard. Ah, okay. Or I can move them for you. Hmm. There we go. Okay, well, I thought that I would start the discussion um, with a little bit of background information about NCCRS, the National College Credit Recommendation Service, um, which, as Bob mentioned, is previously known as um, PONCI, National PONCI, uh, which I refer to as a very unfortunate acronym. Um, so we have changed our name, but we have been doing the same thing since 1973, and it's very similar to the ACE credit evaluation system um, that that um, that Luke mentioned. Um, we've been trying to increase access to higher education for working adults and other non-traditional students by helping them get college credit for learning that takes place outside of the traditional classroom. And when we say non-traditional anymore, of course, we all know that that's really a, a misnomer. There's, there's really no such thing as a non-traditional student anymore. But nonetheless, we'll have to update our mission, I suppose. I can't seem to get the next slide going. There we go. So the way that we do this, the way that we try to increase access is by supervising teams of, of faculty um, members who are subject matter experts in whatever it is we're, we're evaluating. Um, but they must be structured learning experiences. And those evaluators look at um, a number of things that go into the learning experience and the, the inputs and the outcomes. And they, when warranted, determine college credit equivalencies. And our clients, our sponsoring organizations, our corporations, unions, religious organizations, foundations such as the Sailor Foundation, who will be uh, joining us in a moment, municipalities, some testing companies, and a lot of proprietary schools are starting to become interested in, in having college credit. Even if they're nationally accredited, they want, um, they, they want uh, um, NCCRS credit recommendations to help them facilitate articulation uh, with regionally accredited colleges. I am technologically challenged, Amy. Can you hit the next slide? Thank you. And just to um, sort of clarify the, the, and to point out perhaps the difference between the American Council on Education Credit Service and, and our service, which actually were one and the same in the early 70s, um, we are a program of uh, the University of the State of New York, not to be confused with the State University of New York, but USNI is an entity that um, sort of all educational um, programs or um, organizations fall under in the State of New York. And we are supervised by the Regents Research Fund, which is a nonprofit corporation. And um, all USME programs are, do have oversight by the New York State Board of Regents, which is a uh, US Department of Education recognized accrediting body. We are not a membership organization, so colleges and universities are welcome to uh, participate in our program and put themselves on our cooperating college list free of cost. Um, so that's just a slight difference in, in where we get our, um, our academic backing. And at this point, we do um, work with 1,500 colleges and universities who are willing to consider granting college credit based on our recommendations. Of course, as you're aware, all colleges and universities reserve the right to have their own policies in this regard. And, um, 
we, there are certain colleges um, that do accept almost 100% of our credit recommendations, Empire State being, um, being, being one. Hope you don't mind that I stole your logo. <laughs> Which brings us to one of our um, more exciting, challenging uh, evaluations at the end of last year. We're very uh, pleased to work with the Sailor Foundation. Uh, and I will let Steve, uh, right after this, take over and perhaps say more about the Sailor Foundation. But um, we were invited to evaluate uh, three of their courses. And the reason this was so was different for us, perhaps, is that they use open educational resources embedded in their courses. And in, it, at first, uh, initially, I thought, well, does this fit into our evaluation model? And it turns out that, of course, it does. It's a 40-year-old model that still works. It's still relevant today. When we're evaluating uh, a course or a program, we look at the same things that we looked at 40 years ago, perhaps. It's just that, in this case, the resources are not in a textbook um, or in a journal. They are free and open and still, you know, still, still held to the same criteria and standards that, that we always would hold uh, our resources to when we're looking at them. So three courses uh, were successfully um, evaluated for college credit recommendations. And um, I guess at, at that point, I will um, you know, also add that Sailor um, courses, when I first tried to wrap this around a traditional model, I thought that we would need to really focus on the outcomes. And I kept referring to these courses because they're not instructor-led. They're created and peer-reviewed by faculty members, but they're not instructor-led. And so I kept referring to them as study guides really extensive study guides that result in a proficiency exam. And of course, in order for credit recommendations to um, be applied, a student has to take a proctored proficiency exam. But the, you really can't ignore the wonderful inputs, which are made up of um, extensive use of OERs. Um, so it was hard for the evaluators to sort of ignore the inputs, um, and nor should they. So it was, a, it was an evolving process. and. Um, I will let Steve talk about their process and how they embed the OERs into their learning experiences. Hi, everybody. Um, so just uh, some, some quick background about the Sailor Foundation. Um, we were a nonprofit that was started back in uh, 2009. And in the, over the last four years, we've actually put together uh, around 280 online courses that are entirely free. Um, you don't even need to sign up for an account if you want to, to access it. Just come to, uh, to sailor.org and, and start learning. Um, so as Tina mentioned, um, one of the great things about our, our courses is that they're full of OER. Um, we started out uh, as a content aggregator and have slowly transitioned to both aggregating and creating uh, uh, open educational content. So uh, I just kind of kind of wanted to talk you guys through our process for finding, evaluating, and embedding OER into our courses um, to just kind of give you an idea of, of how we do that. So first, you know, what does Sailor consider to be OER? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different definitions out there. You know, is it just Creative Commons, GNU? You know, how does it all fit? And Sailor takes a very uh, Big Ten approach to OER. Um, obviously, the, the, any materials licensed under Creative Commons um, fall into that, that category. Um, also, the uh, GNU license, which is sort of obscured here, I think. And uh, there are, in fact, a lot of materials out on the internet that are licensed under what's called an academic and or non-commercial license, where it's protected by copyright, but the copyright holder will also attach a, a rider to it saying, you know, you can you can reuse this and reproduce it for you know either non-commercial or educational purposes, um, and you know since everything at Sailor is free and you know we don't uh, charge for anything, we were allowed to use a lot, reuse and remix a lot of that material. And then finally, the last is public domain. Um, a lot of our humanities courses, especially you know po political science, history, English, rely heavily on public domain materials. Um, essays, books that were published before 1923 or afterwards that have been put into the public domain. 
Um, so how do we go about, you know, finding all of these resources and putting them in the courses? Oh, sorry. First, um, why do we use them? And, you know, there's a couple specific reasons why, you know, OER works for our model. And the first is flexibility. I mean, it allows partnering organizations, other professors to come into our courses and uh, use them however they want to. If you want to take an entire course and teach it at your school, you have the ability to do that. You can, read, you can uh, take it and redistribute it, you know, re repurpose it however you want. If you want, you know, a specific essay on, you know, the, the Magna Carta, you can come in and find our specific modular content and take it out and use it in your course. And even for students, if they're looking for an image or a PowerPoint presentation about a specific topic, they can come into our courses and extract just that specific part and be able to see the license that goes along with it and know how they can use it. Secondly, secondly, it uh, allows us to scale our courses. So when you know you have a course that's designed entirely from open educational resources, you can take that course and make it available online, and you can al you could also take it and make it available in physical format. So you could take a course and put it on a DVD and make it available to um, you know universities in in Africa. You could take it. Um, so you could take a, an open educational textbook or, and print it out and make your own copy of that and distribute, you know, your the, that textbook throughout, you know, the, the developing world. And then finally, the thing about open educational resources is that they're sustainable. When you rely on links on the internet, a lot of times they can go down, and it becomes sort of a chore to make sure that the materials that you want to use for your course are there. Um, but with OER, you can take material, download it, and put it up on your site, and you never have to worry about whether or not it's going to be there or not. Um, so our process for adding OER to our courses is, you know, first finding it, vetting it, framing it, and then if there's nothing out there that exists already, then we'll actually go ahead and create new open educational resources. Um, so we have a, a very good content analysis team that scours the internet to find uh, open educational resources for us. Now, these aren't subject matter experts. They are um, more familiar with, uh, they're more familiar with licensing and copyright. So they'll go through, you know, these are just a couple of the, the larger repositories they'll check, but, um, and create priority lists for our subject matter experts saying, you know, these are, License under the most creative, open Creative Commons license. We should we should you know try to focus on those. Or you know these are um, a little bit more restrictive, but they're still you know OERs. And then the, the next step in that is to give it to our content matter experts. And you know the the number one myth of OER is that you know if it's free, it's also low quality. But all of the OER that we use in our courses has actually been reviewed by four different professors before it goes up on our in our courses. So in the initial iteration of the course, um, Sailor, the Sailor course designer will look at the list compiled by our content analysis team and try to fit in you know, specific resources, whether it's a textbook, whether it's a lecture series, to the overall course structure that they've already designed. Um, and then later, you know, after, after the course has been finished, um, we put that through a peer review process, which involves a panel of three other professors that look over the that look over the course and determine you know the the quality of the materials you know the, the granularity of it how do they fit into you know what's traditionally taught you know for you know that, that sort of course in a, in a brick and mortar institution um, and also how is each resource framed um, is it accessible to the students do they know what they should be taking out of a specific reading out of out of a specific video. And then finally, another benefit of open educational resources is that if one of our professors does find an error or inconsistency, or if the material is great but it's just a little bit too advanced for an entry-level biology course, they can actually go in and edit it and remix it and customize it for our specific aims. Um, 
and then to talk a little bit more about fitting it into our courses. Um, this is a, an example of what one of our resources looks like. What one of our resources looks like in the course. Um, I pulled this out of uh, our introduction to Western political thought, which is one of our MCCRS review courses, um, and it's a it's a public domain version of uh, Karl Marx on the Jewish question. And you know, you look here, and the professor has done a great job of sort of talk, giving a little bit of background about you know Marx, and specifically you know this essay, and then kind of looking at what should a student you know learn from this. And this also matches up with the learning outcomes that are part of each one of our courses. Each course and then each unit within the course has its own set of learning outcomes that are then what's tested on in the exam. Um, so between the combination of the framing and the learning outcome, student knows what they should be getting out of it and then when they, so when they get to the test, they're ready to go. Um, and then one, you know, we we pride ourselves on not reinventing the wheel. You know, there's four dozen open, open licensed calculus textbooks out there. The world doesn't really need another one. But what it does need is specific resources that, that where, there, where there are gaps. So what we'll do is, as a professor is going through a course, if there's nothing open licensed out there, we'll actually create it ourselves. Um, and you know, we started doing this about two years ago. In the past two years, we've actually created almost 3,000 new um, open education learning objects. So either videos, essays, um, end of unit assessments. We have also um, have a program called the Open Textbook Challenge where any uh, textbook author who owns the copyright to their textbook can relicense it under a Creative Commons license um, in exchange for $20,000. They can also sign up to create a textbook where in a for a course where none exists um, and also get $20,000. We have a third um, way that we, you know, add to the uh, current ecosystem of educational resources and it's through directory licensing where if we've identified a uh, specific professor or organization that has a large quantity of educational resources online that are open access, um, we'll actually go to them and try to negotiate making it openly licensed so that you know, to, to add to the uh, open education ecosystem. Um, I saw there's a couple questions over here in the chat, so I'm going to go look at that or answer those. Uh, you know, so Steve, if, if you, Steve, Sorry, if you wouldn't. Um, if you wouldn't mind just going back, I, I neglected to um, go over my last slide, which I think is relevant to perhaps some of the questions. Um, there's a slide on on what the evaluators look for right here. I mean, um, while the evaluators are looking at the Sailor materials, they, you know, I didn't tell them to sort of focus on the fact that they were open educational resources, but you know, the things that they were looking for and the things they commented on were exactly the same things they would look at if we were looking at a, a, a regular classroom-based course they would, and they were looking at the textbook or, or supplemental readings. You know, relevance, rigor, bias, accessibility, scaffolding, and context. And um, they, they commented on, on all of those things in one way or the other. And I think it, it holds true for uh, classroom learning, uh, traditional learning in, in any sense. Okay, so let me you know take the opportunity to answer some of these questions. Because, you know, the first one here we go. Uh, how are you dealing with flat rolled knowledge books that are part of your curriculum now that they've reverted their license? Well, what they've done is they've put up a paywall so that you know a student needs to pay whatever it is twenty dollars in order to access it. However, with the Creative Commons license, once you license a work under Creative Commons, that license is perpetual. You can't take it away. And now there have been a number of efforts you know, our site included to take the flat world knowledge textbooks before they put the paywall up and create open licensed copies of them. So if you go to our site um, and check out our Sailor bookshelf, um, it includes not only the flat world knowledge textbooks, but also, you know, a number of other exceptional open licensed textbooks that we've used throughout our courses. 
Um, second question. How do you manage currency or relevance of your resources? Who keeps them updated? So for each one of our courses, a year after they've been peer reviewed, they actually go through another peer review, um, which assesses you know, the continued relevancy of the materials. Um, it looks at the psychometric data from the essay or the uh, assessment questions to see if you know, there's any problems with a specific question and the way it's worded if there's a problem with the resource that's supposed to address the learning outcome that's being tested in the assessment, we'll also look at that and the changes to that on a yearly basis. Um, no one else has any questions. Uh, I think we're all set. I, you know, I thank you once again for uh, letting me and Tina present here. Um, it's, been, it's been great. And uh, if you have any other questions about the Sailor Foundation or about the uh, educational resources that we use, you can feel free to send me an email. Thank you so much, Tina and Steve. That was great. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me. Sure. And, and remember, if you guys um, have any questions, please feel free to continue in the chat box. My turn. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be presenting on the Lumina Foundation grant that we have at SUNY Empire State College. I'm the project director. And this PowerPoint was developed in partnership with Nan Travers, who is our fearless content expert. She's an expert in the field of prior learning assessment and assessment in general. So one of the first things. Um, when you look at the grant is what are we actually trying to solve? And it's how to recognize and assess university level learning, no matter how, when, why, where it was acquired. So um, this, this framework we're going to eventually develop will be able to use, um, be used to assess any type of learning. So whether you learned it from a course or um, a professional experience or a certificate or you learned it by yourself through Sailor any type of learning that is university level. It's specifically designed, though, for self-authored learning paths, so for things like OERs. Um, but it could be easily used um, to develop a course, too, a traditional face-to-face -face course. And we're also trying to focus on learning as it develops instead of sort of the conclusion. We want to see the learning all the way through. So it's not just prior learning assessment, but emergent learning assessment as well. The Lumina grant goals are to develop a framework that assess the university level learning gain from open educational resources. And that's specific to this grant, but our framework hopefully will be able to um, with quality and validity assess any types of learning. So um, in our first year, we're going to be um, creating this framework. And in the second year, we're going to be piloting the framework to assess students in four sailor courses. And that's great that Steve was here, because um, you've got a really great introduction to what sailor is. And it was wonderful um, that you also got a great introduction to what prior learning assessment is. This is also connecting to the SUNY Real Initiative, or Open SUNY. And we're trying to make sure that the framework and the policies, procedures, and um, pilot we eventually create is scalable so that you can use it with a lot of students. And um, it's a, a little bit easier to use than necessarily the traditional prior learning assessment methods. Um, that it's really simple for a student to be able to write to. because. Um, as stated earlier, sometimes that's the hardest thing to um, be able to really capture that learning. And it's for different types of assessment, so not just necessarily prior learning, but um, emergent learning as well. So this grant is going to be for two years, and hopefully we'll get everything done by September 14th, 2014, and we'll be able to share it with everybody. Um, we're going to have developed the framework in year one and then pilot it in year two. We're going to be focusing on two humanities classes and two uh, STEM OERs to begin with. But again, um, it's going to be able to be used for any type of content, no matter how, where, when it was acquired. 
we are going to have an academic team of faculty and um, some experts who are going to develop the framework and then an expert panel um, who are then going to revise and um, help us out at the um, end of both year one and year two. And at the end of year two, we're going to have an institute where we're openly sharing the framework and research. So it will be openly licensed. And any institution, any crediting agency will be able to use the framework. I'd like to recognize our wonderful academic team. Um, so if uh, any of you see any of these people out on the internet, please make sure that you thank them for their kind contribution to our project. Um, Rihanna Rogers actually did a presentation earlier today on open educational resources. And you already heard Victoria's name mentioned um, by Francis and Kathy. And we will have an expert panel. Um, they're all experts in the field of either prior learning assessment and or open education. A lot of them have either developed MOOCs or open educational resources or have spent a huge amount of time um, on prior learning assessment. So they have lots of experience. And we're excited for them to start revising our framework. So a little background on open assessment and prior learning assessment. There are a bunch of different learning environments for OERs. Um, MOOCs, for example, through Coursera. There's textbooks. There's courses. Um, many can be free, like Sailor's All Free, or low cost. As you could see, Flatword World Knowledge has a paywall, but it's very low cost. You know, it's $20 in comparison to the hundreds of dollars you'd spend on a normal textbook. So there are a bunch of different sources um, for open educational resources. And we're hopefully developing a framework that um, you can use to assess all kinds of learning. Um, a lot of open educational resources are developed by faculty members. So sometimes that surprises um, people. Of course, it doesn't surprise you guys because you already heard it from Sailor. Um, but sometimes it does. Most of them are developed by faculty members or experts in the field. OERs often rely on peer sourcing or crowdsourcing, so that collection um, of information over a variety of people, like a vast wealth of knowledge. Something like Wikipedia is peer sourced. Um, so you know anyone can keep adding and making it better and better and better and better. There's also a huge range of timeline to completion. For Sailor, it doesn't matter when you start. It doesn't matter when you stop. Um, for Coursera, you might actually have to sign into a particular MOOC, and it takes eight weeks or six weeks. So some um, OERs actually have a very specific timeline to completion, and some don't. So that's a challenge we need to address, because most of traditional higher ed is very focused on speed time. And you have that traditional three hour long course that you take once a week. Um, this isn't necessarily the same. There's also a huge range of student purposes. So students might already come to the OER with lots and lots of background knowledge. They might come with no knowledge. They might need remedial help. They might not. They might just take you know, the first section of the course or just the last section of the course. They might skip around a bunch. So there's a range of student purposes and needs in an OER environment that makes um, assessing this learning a little bit different. And as we heard from the Sailor Foundation, um, a lot of their courses are area study based, uh, as opposed to um, like Coursera, a lot of them are more elective based. A lot of Sailor courses focus on gen eds, which is wonderful. Um, we love that because a lot of students uh, who do PLA um, really need those you know, introduction courses. There are no time requirements. Uh, there isn't as much focus on that like peer interaction as MOOCs. Um, MOOCs are massively open online courses. And a lot of what happens in a MOOC is the learning acquired by connecting with your other peers. You can go through a Sailor course without any of that, which makes it you know, really great for that student who um, needs a little bit longer to complete something or is doing this completely on their own. And as previously mentioned, they're built by professors that go through a training program. They do actually have a behind the scenes e-portfolio um, where you can upload some documentation, which is wonderful. And there's a range of activities and assessments. 
So this is sort of the PLA model we're trying to break down a little. Um, at Empire State College, you usually take a course or a workshop, then you write a learning essay, you include supporting documentation, this goes into a portfolio, and then you have some form of interview at the end. The um, way we're approaching it is a little bit different. We still might have them write an essay. Of course, they'll have to have um, supporting documentation. But we're trying to rework things a little, because the student might not necessarily have taken a workshop or a course that teaches them how to write prior learning assessment. So what we're hoping to do is recognize university level learning as a primary assessment and then assess uh, the content. So that's a little bit different, too, than traditional prior learning assessment, where you have a content expert come in and say, yep, they really know the knowledge in the field, and this is college level learning. We're trying to assess whether it's college level learning up front through this framework, and then layer the content on top. And you keep it hearing me mention frameworks. We are pulling a ton of frameworks together, um, including Lumina's degree qualifications framework. And these are some of the things that you'll usually see in qualifications frameworks. They have some form of civic learning, applied learning, broader integrative knowledge, skill development, and then content-specific specialized knowledge. So those are usually um, pretty similar categories you'll see throughout all frameworks developed. We're trying to see you know, what frameworks have in common um, and make a really cohesive meta framework based on all of these things. And this is what the Lumina DQP part of it looks like. Um, and in this one, it's a chart. And you'll see um, that they have three different levels from master's, bachelor's, and associates. And each has a slightly different set of objectives or learning outcomes. Each framework defines them a little bit differently. But they're inside the box. And they each have categories, specialized knowledge, broad integrative knowledge. Most of the time, they're um, in some form of chart or rubric. Um, not always. They also have uh, like a web-based design, too. So again, frameworks are often organized by levels. As you saw before, they may have the associate's level, and then the bachelor's level, and then the graduate level. They may be calling the levels 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But usually, they correspond to some form of um, learning year in the process, whether it be high school or PhD level. They also have concepts and learning outcomes. Um, and usually they're you know, within the side that framework. And surprisingly, especially in the uh, European frameworks, you'll see a lot of high school equivalencies as well. So they're not just limited to um, higher levels of education. So through our frameworks, we're looking at a bunch of different countries, um, mostly EU countries. They've been doing the largest amount of work on frameworks, and I'll show you what they've been doing in a second. Um, but they're you know, way ahead of the game. They've developed a ton of frameworks. Each country references to those frameworks. Um, but Australia has done a really good job, too. They're way ahead of the game. South Africa has begun developing some stuff. Canada has something. Um, South Asian nations do, and small states of the Commonwealth. Uh, the U.S. tends to be more focused on organizations creating frameworks than a national government creating frameworks or regional government creating frameworks. In most of the EU countries, it's the referencing framework of Denmark or the framework of Ireland or the framework of Switzerland. Um, in the U.S., they tend to be things developed out of Kale or out of Next or out of Lumina instead of out of a university or even out of the United States government. So it tends to be a little bit of a different focus. There also are a lot of labor um, organizations like APAC who have been creating frameworks so that they can align traditional employee learning with uh, what is happening in universities and colleges. So there are a lot of vocational programs, too. And you'll even see a couple of uh, levels that indicate, you know, this is a vocational study versus a PhD level. So the main frameworks that are developed 
um, are the European Qualifications Framework, and that's the one I mentioned earlier. Um, it's one of the most developed frameworks. Most of the countries in the EU actually reference that framework, so instead of creating their own from scratch, they usually say, well, this is how our system's a little bit different, and then they create the National Qualifications Frameworks based on that. Um, once in a while, they'll mention the higher uh, European Higher Education Area Framework. Um, it's not quite as popular as the EQF, um, but it is another European framework. And you can see they're, they're very, very far ahead of uh, where we are right now. There's also some transnational qualification frameworks that um, collaborate a bunch of countries together, like the virtual um, states of the Commonwealth. And here is an example of what the EQF looks like. And again, this is one of the most well-used frameworks in the entire world. It's talked about constantly. Um, this is level eight through five. These are you know, what's mostly considered that secondary level. Um, and so these are some of the learning outcomes that they look for. Some are skills, um, cognitive practices, and performance indicators. And you can see as they, they keep going up. So what they've been doing um, with the European Qualifications Framework <laughs> is actually using it to align to other countries. So for example, um, if you're in Denmark and you get a master's degree, what does that equate to in Lithuania? And you can see that a level 7 here equals a level 7 here. Um, but the, they don't always follow the same pattern in every country. Um, and sometimes the bachelor's degrees will really be level five. Um, and you'll see really specific in some countries where they have an agri agricultural economic certificate will really go down to that very small level. So you'll sort of see where that matches up um, in another country. But they're using a lot of these frameworks to sort of align over multiple countries, um, not just assess learning within their own country, which is a really novel and interesting way of using it. And a way we can sort of also um, imagine like University of Albany being, you know, this country, and then we have a general framework, and then the University of Empire, State College here, and then you just compare, you know, what learning outcomes go to go to which school. So, you know, it's a, an interesting way to use a framework. We're not really thinking on that path, but um, it's something to consider. So next steps. Um, we're currently working on developing the meta framework. Our academic team is meeting next week for the first time. Uh, they just got so many frameworks to read. Um, they're really excited to start developing a framework. And we're going to be sharing the progress throughout the year and next year as well as we can begin piloting it. So although this was just a little taste of what we're doing, um, we'll keep you up to date as we move forward. Um, and hopefully we'll get a really great framework that assesses college level or university level learning no matter where, when, or how it was acquired. Any questions? I was trying to really fast because I know uh, we didn't have a lot of time and I know Tina has to leave. But any questions? Oh, I'll have to check that out with the multiple meanings of MOOCs, because um, that has been causing a little bit of confusion. So that, that's a really great link. Thank you, University of Delaware. Well, Amy, thank you. And uh, we would like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, the, for those of you who are listening to the recording, we hope you enjoy it as well. Uh, most of the presenters put up their contact information. So I would like to thank all of our presenters today, uh, Kathy Leaker and Francis Boyce, and then uh, Dr. Luke Dowden, and then Steve Phillips and Tina Grant, and um, of course, Amy. And Amy, thank you again for putting this together. Uh, if you should need to reach us at any time, everybody's contact information is here or the majority of our contact information is on the Empire State College uh, main page. So 
thank you for attending again, and uh, we hope to see you soon in further discussions on open education. And our slides will be posted as well as the recording on the Open Education Week website. Thank you, everyone.